I okay. want to introduce you today to my friend, Sarah Geringer. We met on Twitter. I have not made a lot of friends on social media, but I had the pleasure of meeting up with her last summer. Uh, we were in part of uh, the same group. I think originally was on Facebook and then we connected more on Twitter. So Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I am a wife. I'm a mom of three big kids and uh, I am a writer. I'm a full-time freelance writer. I'm also an author and speaker. Um, right now I'm loving the garden season. I love to garden and uh, I read over 100 books a year so I'm a total bookworm and um, I just I've lived in the Midwest almost my whole life so I love the quieter country pace of living and I'm just glad to be here today. It's great to have you here today, Sarah. That is so cool that you have been able to accomplish all that stuff and you live, it sounds like you live out in the country. Um, so this whole social media thing and the, the video conferencing and everything is not new to you. This is something you've been doing for a while. Well, um, not that long because uh, in May of 2019, we finally got high-speed internet at my home. So uh, I have counted that one of my biggest blessings of this quarantine time, that it allows me to keep in touch with people without having to drive into town where the signal's stronger. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's totally awesome. And, you know, I started out in Southern California and now I'm in the middle of nowhere, Texas. So uh, this has been a great blessing to me. I was already doing telehealth by, um, you know, the video with my right. California clients. I'm licensed in California. And so this isn't new to me in that regard, but it is new to me in terms of doing what we're doing today and actually getting to know people that we otherwise would never meet. Right. Exactly. That's, that's the beauty of the time that we're living in. As much as I would really like to go back to living in more Ingalls Wilder time, there's a there's a huge part of me that would love to go back to that simpler time. I know that God has put us in this time and place for a reason, and we can actually reach more people through social media. So it is a blessing. It is. It's totally amazing how God takes something that's intended for harm and turns it into something that's good. So I really appreciate what you're doing. You mentioned the, the quarantine, and that really is on everybody's mind right now what's going to happen to our world the i believe that that fear is actually a greater uh, threat to us than the virus itself although i take that very seriously i haven't been out of the house in in almost two weeks and the last time i went out it was just to the market and back so um you know the, we look at it and we think about anxiety we think about fear but actually worry falls in that same category as well. And how timely your writing and your speaking is for such a time as this. We've heard that saying quite a bit too. So Sarah, tell us a little bit about your book, um, how you came to write it, and then we'll get into a little bit more about what's in the book. Okay. Uh well, in 2003, uh, I started reading uh, the One Year Bible every, every day. I had been a Christian my whole life, but I had never read through the entire Bible in order to challenge myself. And uh, it divides a daily reading into Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. And the edition I was using, it just bolded a certain verse in in every single day. And so I would take that bold verse and just meditate on it. I'd think about it, I'd pray about it. It would stick with me throughout the day because I always did this first thing in the morning. And uh, like I said, I'm an avid reader and my favorite genre is Christian nonfiction. So I'm very interested in spiritual growth. But I can honestly tell you, um, nothing 
changed my thought life more than interacting with God's word every single day for that entire year. And I started, one of the biggest differences I saw was recognizing what the Bible was saying about me and how God viewed me and his plans for my life contrasted with the lies I was believing Satan was telling me, that my inner critic was telling me, that I had listened to for 30 plus years. And uh, that's when God started to change my, change my thoughts through the power of his word. And so by the time that I got this contract to write this book, I had already been practicing Christian meditation for 15 years, uh, just by sitting down with my Bible, allowing the Holy Spirit to use God's word to minister to me and just to change me, to encourage me and strengthen my faith. So it's really that powerful. It's, it's very simple, but it's very powerful. Wow, that's an amazing story, Sarah. I think a lot of us, and I'm a writer as well, as you know, and and most of my viewers know that I've written books, um, but we really do write about what we know. And so in your book, you are really putting into words, in a, I would say in a condensed form, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of a guideline, a, a guidebook that people can use to zero right in on those things that are causing anxiety. And you mentioned a couple of those things. You said, you know, the lies that you believe and your inner critic. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two? Do you see a difference or does it feel like it's just two sides of the same coin? Uh, I think there's a, a subtle difference. I mean, if we look, um, the book of Job is probably the, the clearest example of how spiritual warfare looks. At the beginning of the book of Job, we see God and Satan talking about Job and what to do with him. And God allows Satan to um, bring all this harm onto Job for no good reason. Uh, so we see that spiritual um, battle going on behind the scenes, but of course Job doesn't see that. Not, not when it's happening anyway. And then in the next 40 so chapters of Job, he's lamenting his uh, struggle and he's being very, very honest with God. And he says things like, you know, cursed be the day I was born, you know, and he's in the deepest pit of depression, maybe that any other human has ever experienced, quite frankly. Um, so we can kind of get a glimpse into how he's down on himself because of this situation that Satan put him in, basically. And so I think some of us have a stronger inner critic than others. I think it depends on your personality. It depends on your conditioning um, in your home environment. Uh, if maybe you have a, a horrible boss at work who's planting these lies on you. You know, other people can influence that critic as well. Uh, but I think sometimes it's just Satan wreaking havoc on us. And sometimes it's just our sinful nature that has a distorted view of the person that God created us to be and the plan he has for us. So a lot of times Satan doesn't have to do anything at all. He just really plants a seed and then lets our mind run with the, the um, negative thought pattern. And he doesn't really have to do anything at all except just sit back and watch us get discouraged and defeated. And so, um, yeah, we, we have to not only, um, to, to start transforming our thought life, we need to recognize the power of God's word and the truth that it holds. We also need to become aware of the spiritual battle that we're in. And then thirdly, we need to start becoming self-aware of our own things that we're telling ourselves that aren't true and aren't helpful, that aren't wise, and start replacing those thoughts with scripture and then using those scriptures to fight Satan's 
uh, triggers when he's trying to get, he's trying to tempt us. So it's, it's a process that once you practice it and you get in the habit of Christian meditation, it will get easier. It's not, it's not an easy process. Mm -hmm. It's probably one of the hardest things is to change the way that you think, but it is possible and God will empower us to do it. And the best place to start is by learning his word and thinking deeply about it so you can apply it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a, a lot of information condensed there in a, just a very few minutes time. Wow, and so many different directions I could go with, with what I want to ask you next. Um, but one that comes to my mind is the term meditation. Is that a lot of people, um, when they hear the word meditation, they, they think of new age, they think of, uh, you know, the more secular version of that. I know I've worked with uh, clients who are Christians, but also with non-Christian clients. And some of my non-Christian clients actually trying to meditate was very difficult for them because they would end up feeling more depressed and more yeah. down with the meditation they were trying to do. Um, so I would tell them, because in that particular setting, I wasn't allowed to say, you know, you need to know Jesus, that just didn't work. So I would tell them just focus on goodness and light, just keep focusing on goodness and light. And that seemed to help. But yeah, what I found with my clients, which I'm also all about teaching truth over lies, that's a major focus of, of what I am called to do. Mm -hmm. But what for you is the difference can you be a little more explicit about the difference between meditation and christian meditation and, and kind of the the build a case for christian meditation in other words sure. i want to understand your process so from what i have learned about uh, worldly meditation when i took um, world religions class in college is it's emptying your mind and then focusing on mantras or yeah, affirmations. I am strong. I am worthy. I am at peace. Those things are good, okay? But they're not the best. And here's why. In the book of John, in John chapter 1, it talks about, in the beginning was the Word. And it talks about the Word was made flesh in, in Jesus. So God's Word has living power. It has divine power because it belongs, his word belongs to him. And it's the ultimate source of wisdom and it's the ultimate source of peace. Jesus told us later in John, he says, peace I give to you, I do not give as the world gives. And it's because he's the origin of peace. He's the prince of peace. The world can only give us peace that lasts so long, maybe as long as a bubble bath or a glass of wine or a trip to Tahiti. That's, and then we go back to our chaotic, stressful world. But just like Jesus promised, um, when he was talking to the woman at the well, he said, I am going to give you living water and you'll never be thirsty again. She didn't understand that. She had come to a well to draw water just for physical sustenance. But he was saying, no, no, I'm going to give you something that will last every day, that will satisfy your spirit. And so I think about when we, when we meditate on scripture, which is all Christian meditation is, there's no um, strange or surreal aspect to it. It's actually very practical. You take a certain verse of scripture, you think about it deeply, you ask yourself a few basic questions, such as, what does this verse tell me about God? And what does this verse tell me about the kind of life he wants me to live? If you approach a verse, any verse in the whole Bible, with that um, mindset, you will get something personal and applicable from it and it will it has the power to change your thought life 
because it is the living word of God. It's not just words another human wrote. It's not just something you pull out of the air when you empty your mind. It's literally replacing the faulty things in your mind with the truth, the living truth of God's word. So that's the primary um, difference between Christian meditation and worldly meditation and why worldly meditation might feel help you feel better for a little while, kind of like a candy bar. I'm not going to lie. Uh, dark square of Iridelli does make me feel better for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and then I, you know, I just play more and more in an unhealthy way. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's not Christian meditation does the opposite. It refines you. It purifies you. It strengthens you. It comforts you. It encourages you. And one of the greatest aspects of it is it helps you encourage others because it starts becoming a part of your inner dialogue. It's hidden in your mind and heart. And so then you can start sharing it with others too. So it, it really does bless you in many different ways. Wow, that is really powerful, Sarah. I like the way that you put that. It sounds like you're actually... Uh, making it personal by asking those questions. What is this passage? What is this part of scripture telling me about God? And the second part, what is it telling me about the life he wants for me? Those are very relational questions, which I totally identify with as someone who specializes in, in uh, intimate relationships between a man and a woman. But um, that part seems to be as important as the thought part is that you're actually really connecting with the one who created you, the one who knows who you are and what he wants for you and wants to speak to you and oftentimes speaks through scripture. Is, is that what you're saying in this? Or did I pick up something different with my own bent? No, that's right. And one of my primary goals um, in my life, but specifically as a Christian, an author is to overcome biblical illiteracy. So uh, in the American church, many people, this is within the church, don't have a um, knowledge of scripture. And it's a, it's a travesty because never in world history has there been greater access to God's word. And yet many of us have Bibles that we, we don't ever read. And what we're what we're kind of doing, I think, um, by going to church week after week or listening to podcasts or however you interact with God's word, it's just skimming the surface and you're not letting it in. So what, what Christian meditation does, I mean, it's kind of like if you had a bottle of multivitamins on your kitchen table or counter and you just look at it and you keep thinking, Oh yeah, that's good for me. I know I should take that. That's, I mean, that's power, powerful stuff, you know, but you never open the bottle and take one. It's worthless. Basically. It's not, it's not doing any good for you. It's just sitting there. So that's exactly, that's a good demonstration of what God's word can do. Like, for example, if you, I am borderline anemic. So I have to eat uh, iron-rich foods. I have to take a supplement every day, or I feel I can feel when I'm not treating myself right. So I have to take a little bit of iron every day to help my body function the best that it can. And God's word is a lot like that. It is meant to keep us on track. It's meant to keep us healthy. It's meant to strengthen us so that we can fight this life in the best way possible. And Jesus told us, in this world, you will have troubles. He, he did not say this would be easy. But he said that we can overcome in his power. So why would we not interact personally with his word to know how he's specifically equipping us in our own personalities, in our own giftings, in our own stage of life, 
Because I can tell you the lessons that I learned in 2003 when I started reading the One Year Bible, even though it's the exact same scriptures I've interacted with every year, I learned something different because I'm coming at it from a different angle in my life every time. You know, when I, when I started reading, I wasn't even a mom. You know, and now I have teenagers. So it, it has different applications for me now than it did when I interacted with it almost 20 years ago. So that's, that's why we really do need to dig in. And it doesn't take but five minutes a day. It's not like a huge commitment of time that you have to, you know, shut everything down for 30 minutes and close your eyes and try to, you know, come up with this long conversation with God. That's not what it is. It's really, really practical and it enables you to start having little conversations with God throughout the day, which is more normal for most of us with our loved ones. We're talking to them in little bits and pieces, not these sermon length uh, conversations. Yeah. And so I think it just enhances our relationship with God and deepens it. Yeah. What would you say to someone who is either not a Christian or a new Christian where in the Bible would you have them start? Well, I have heard this and I believe this myself. I think that the book of John is an excellent place to start. And it's because it's the, um, of all the gospels, it's the most um, personal approach. I think um, John calls himself the disciple who Jesus loved. And I think, I kind of think that he was Jesus' best friend, really. And so he gives a very intimate look at who Jesus was and how he interacted with people. And I think all of us connect with stories. Uh, that's just coded in our DNA. Uh, that's one reason I've told stories in every single chapter of my book, because I know that's important to engage people and help them connect with me and my story. Jesus did the same thing. He, he told stories, but he also connected with the stories that were going on in people's lives, like the woman at the well that I was talking about, and I think that's in John 3, um, if I'm right. It's early in the book of John, and uh, I think that would be a, a great place to start, and one of the easy approaches you could take is go through the book of John and pull out all the I am statements. I think there's about a dozen or so in that book. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. And think about what that means and how that applies, what it, what it tells you about God, and then how that applies to your life. And I think just meditating on the I am statement, statements would be enough to um, give you peace and a lot of meat to kind of digest um, and learning about who God is and, and how much he cares about you. That is beautiful, Sarah. I really love that. Um, you know, one of my favorite ones is I am the vine, you yeah. know, stay, stay connected. Mm -hmm. So, um, I won't ask you what, what chapter and verse that is because <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I, I love the stories. And, and one of the things that, that I've been thinking about these last few days with the the pandemic and the economic issues that we don't yet know what's going to come with all that. Um, but just my own meditation, I was thinking about all of a sudden I thought about the Bible stories that I learned as a kid and the, you know, the story of, of the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish and, you know, uh, the walls of Jericho coming down and just tons and tons of stories that I grew up with that I realized at some point that my own children never really heard those stories. I thought, you know, the church was teaching them, but the denomination we were involved in, were talking more about social justice and being nice and being kind. And they missed the power that the creator of the universe, the one who owns it all, you know, what he does, and virtually every Bible story that I could think of, things looked hopeless. They looked like there was no way it was ever going to come about, but because of 
who God is, who Jesus is, and that he's real and alive and connects to us, which is what you're talking about, that he still has the power to turn things around. He wants us really to connect with him. And I think your, your, your ideas, the way that you have been able to express what's been helpful to you is something that people are really needing right now. You know, um, I, one suggestion that I've thought about making, I haven't yet, but for people who are, are not Christian, who don't know those Bible stories is to get a children's Bible story book and yeah. read them aloud. So they're familiar with who God is in that kind of elementary story level, if you will, I actually became a Christian in, uh, in Bible school. You know, mm-hmm. as we were standing there seeing, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, do you, I don't know if you remember that, that song, but it's come in today, come in to stay. And I really connected with him at that level. And I realized he's been with me all along, mm-hmm. but a lot of people don't have that exposure. They have an excessive exposure to the lies, you know, and that makes it very, very difficult. So uh, you've already hit on a lot of the, the practical tips tips. Is there anything more that you want to add to that? Um, just in how people can begin to engage in, in the Christian meditation, anything else? Yeah. Um, just a couple things. Um, one thing you can do is you can go to biblegateway.com. That's a free website. You can just type in the word peace and it'll bring up all the verses in the Bible that are on peace And those are wonderful ones to meditate on uh, with anxiety. And I'll I'll tell you that um, when my launch team was interacting with my book, by far, uh, this was back in October, um, before the pandemic was over here, by far the most popular chapter with people was anxious thoughts and how to handle them. And so we were already living in an anxious world before this happened, and now it's just at fever pitch. And I think one of the main reasons that we're anxious is because we're not familiar with God's character, and we don't recognize that he's sovereign, and that he's transcendent over this, and that he's in total control. And so I think we have a wonderful opportunity right now, with some of us have more time on our hands, to to just study God's word and learn about his character and learn about the ways that he worked in people's lives by going back through those Bible stories and, and opening up a dialogue with him in prayer and uh, just trusting him to take care of your situation. Um, my book right now, uh, I know that some people are having trouble getting uh, things delivered because For example, Amazon is prioritizing delivery of essential goods, you know. So I asked my publisher to extend a special price indefinitely. So as many people as wanted to could take advantage of the deal. So right now, um, if people are interested, the Kindle version of my book, I'll show it right here, is $2.99. So um, even... You know, if you're not really sure what the future holds, I would just recommend that whatever you're purchasing to help you deal with anxiety would be something that nurtures you and nourishes you instead of it's just a temporary fix. Like I mentioned, dark chocolate for me is is one of those things. Uh, But for $3, you can't even get a lunch out for that price. You know, you could get help the power of God's word. And another thing that I recently created to be a a supplement to this is uh, it's on my website. If you go on the blog portion, it's in the sidebar and it's called overcome, overcome meditate. I'm sorry, overcome anxiety with Christian meditation. And so what this is, I pulled key verses out of the anxious thoughts chapter that everyone said they needed so much and I created them into a printable and I'll tell you why I did that so research proves 
that if you write something down, this it could be anything, this could be your grocery list, you know, um, whatever, um, sermon notes, you know, if you write something down, you have a 40% better memory retention rate than simply reading it or listening to it. So by, by writing out God's word, in addition to meditating on it and reading it, you are really supercharging the power to hide it in your heart and mind, and then um, use it to counter Satan when he's fighting you. And I say this, all, almost every interview I have, I tell this, um, when Jesus was tempted, you can go back and look for the temptation of Jesus in the Bible. Satan tempted him in three different areas, and he used scripture to counter Satan. And he pulled it up just like this. Of course, he was the son of God. But let's just think about that. This is, this is God in human form. And even he is using scripture to fight Satan. And I think he did that to teach us what we need to do. So if you intentionally hide God's word in your heart and mind, when those anxiety triggers start, you can start, I'll, I'll tell you one right now, I'm not even going to look it up, because it was my meditation verse for all of 2017. It's, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. That's Isaiah 26, 3 NIV. Because I meditated on that thousands of times that year, it's, it's written, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like on a stone tablet somewhere <laughs> in my uh, <laughs> subconscious yeah. mind. And so, but, but when Satan tempts me to anxiety, I can say, no, no, you get back because my mind is steadfast because I trust in God and therefore I can choose perfect peace instead of anxiety. So I can make it into a prayer. I can make it into a declaration against Satan and his lies that he's telling me. And when I do that, when I use scripture to counter him, I feel stronger and the battle stops right there. I mean, he's going to keep slinging arrows at me, but that is a way to shut him up and feel like you're overcoming because you are, you're overcoming in God's power instead of your own, instead of some worthless worldly mantra, you're using the living power of God to fight your spiritual battles and to tell yourself truth that you need to hear too. That's beautiful, Sarah. I love the way you put that. I can tell that it's really deep inside of you. I'm going to actually be sure to add a link to uh, that particular part of your blog so folks can get to that. I'll yeah. also add a link to your book. Can you hold the book up again and, and sure. tell us the title? It's a little okay, hard to so see on the screen. Again, this is uh, my book, Transforming Your Thought Life, Christian Meditation and Focus. Uh, just real quick, the first introduction talks about how to practice Christian meditation and all the benefits, including the physical benefits it has. And then the other uh, 17 chapters are different thought life struggles and then pursuing a virtue. So like in the anxious thoughts chapter, you pursue the virtue of peace. So, so that's, um, that's kind of the layout of it. And people have been using this book in a unique way. Most of them zone in on whatever their problem problem area is. And I think we all have what I call a characteristic sin. And mine is um, thoughts that criticize others. And I talk about that in that chapter. And so most people are zoning in on the chapter that resonates with them most. And then they're bouncing around. They're like, oh, I had a lot more problems than I realized. But I, I did it that way so that you could just engage with it however made sense to you. And it won't, it won't hurt you um, to engage with the book in that manner, so. Okay, so you start off with instructions on how to do this and what the benefits are, but then it's broken down into different uh, situations. So it'd be okay for somebody to read that first part, understand how to do it, and then dive into whatever jumped out at them the most as they scan the table of contents. That sounds brilliant. And, and what a cool thing that the Lord led you to do this when this is something that people were going to need so much right now. It really, um, 
certainly we were anxious. We'd been anxious for a long time. And there's nothing like a, a big crisis to bring all that forward for us and make right. us more aware of just how anxious we've already been. So, right. And actually, one thing I'm working on right now is a teen girl version of this book. It will come out in October 2021 20, because the Gen Zers, uh, their characteristic problem of their generation is anxiety. Uh, and so if we can build ourselves up um, with the truth of God's word, we can start helping our younger people uh, counter their problems. So I wish that book was already out because it, be, it would be great for these young people, but God's timing is perfect. And I trust, I trust that he'll help me to write a book that's perfect for them and their needs. Yeah. And at the right time. At He's right really time. good with timing, for sure. Yeah. So, Sarah, how can people get in touch with you um, if they want to know more about having you speak or just want to watch your videos? I know you've been doing some meditation in the Psalms um, yeah. lately. Yeah, so you can really, the home base for me is sarahgaringer.com, and that's where I write about finding peace in God's word. And you can find on the very front page, you'll find all my books that I've written, um, the links to all my social media, uh, which I'm on every single day, every outlet I do something different on. And uh, like you said, Dr. Debbie, what I started in 2020 is a totally free Christian meditation on the Psalms. And so three days a week, I pick a single verse out of the Psalms and I post a video on uh, YouTube and in a private Facebook group and I also make a printable of it so you can really start hiding it in your heart and mind and you can find the link to that on my site as well. So I hope you'll go over there and follow me in whatever um, whatever venue is your favorite to interact with. So I'll be there. Okay. Great. Sarah, thank you so much for your time today. I can just see the joy of the Lord in your face. It is so beautiful. And what a beautiful heart you have to want to share with people. I just, I thank the Lord for you, for your friendship, and wish you all the best as you follow his leading into the next thing that he has planned for you to do to love on his people. Thank you so much. This has been a joy. And it's, just been a fun conversation for me and I hope everybody watching it enjoys it too. Okay. Well, we'll talk again soon.